Now we have some basic vocabulary for talking about the coordination of the limbs in locomotion using such concepts as oscillation and phase. And the reason that we want to do that is because we see similar patterns of organization throughout nature. And here's a nice example that illustrates similarities between the mode of locomotion of inchworm. An inchworm is tiny and a cheetah radically different animal but as you can see from the three pictures there there's something very similar about the way they move in each case they have an elongated body which coils up producing potential energy and then the front leaves the ground and extends leaving the rear parts on the ground when the front lands then the rear part coils back up again the sequence of movements looks very very similar despite the fact that they have completely different bodies and an inchworm doesn't even have legs so these are the kind of basic principles we're looking for now as we start to explore various ways in which body parts can be coordinated in locomotion there's been a lot of work done here here's a systematization of all possible four-legged gates and they've been organized in the following way there's a rectangular plot there, and the x-axis of that documents the percentage of the cycle that each foot is on the ground. So each foot will be on the ground for some percentage of the cycle, maybe a lot of it, maybe a little bit. And this will apply to all four-legged animals. The y-axis shows something about the coordination among the limbs, the percentage of the cycle that the forefoot fall follows the hind foot fall on the same side. So using those two basic indices, we can look at all four-legged animals and plop them in here. So a hippopotamus obviously walks very differently from a mouse. The hippopotamus is very heavy, and its feet will be on the ground an awful lot more than a mouse would. Um, and yet, all the gates then fall into what you can see here, the shaded area, the gray shaded area on the plot, captures all four-footed gates. Now, an individual animal that has more than one gate at its disposal will occur several times in this plot. So the horse is there, for example, trotting and galloping and running. Um, the purpose of this is not so much to worry about the details of where a given animal is, but to see that this way of thinking allows us to systematically organize our observations of many different kinds of bodies. Here's an example using those insights from that plot of some of the variation that we find in quadruped gates. So although they're all organized using these basic principles of coordination, um, constrained phase relationships, there's still a great deal of variability possible. And there's some interesting ones there. We've got the transverse gallop, the rotary gallop. You can see different body sorts leading to different phase combinations of the limbs. The one on the bottom right is kind of interesting. It's a very simple pattern. If you look at the little lines beneath it, you can see that all four legs are on the ground at the same time. And then all four legs are off the ground. This is called a pronk, and it's rather rare. So I thought I'd just show you a pronk in action. Uh, these are from Springboks. That's it. Yeah. Pronking is rather rare. The only other animal I'm aware of that pronks is Pepe Le Pew, the little cartoon skunk. He pronks as well. But it's a possible gait, and we can see here that there are principles organizing the limbs. So if an animal occurs several times in that plot, for example. It has several gates at its disposal. Horses will all have at least three gates, and many horses have many more than that. So walking, trotting, and galloping, but then there are specialized gates like cantering and pacing, and I don't know what. Um, if an animal has multiple gates at its disposal, is it free to just choose one over the other? Is this just a matter of free will? Or are there principles, lawful principles, physical principles underlying this as well. 
you can ask yourself the same question about your choice as to whether to walk or run. In a sense, it's free. In a sense, it's not free. It's not independent of the speed at which you're going to locomote, right? So here's an example of a really good piece of scientific visualization from an experiment done studying just this question. And this experiment was done using three very well-trained ponies. They were so well-trained that these ponies would walk on a treadmill at a variety of speeds, and they would also trot and gallop to order on the treadmill at a variety of speeds, all the time with a big bag over their nose, measuring their oxygen consumption. Not every horse will do this. These were particularly good ponies. And I'll walk you through this graph because it doesn't explain itself. First, we're going to pay attention to the top half of the graph, where we see three different data sets plotted. The leftmost data set, which has the filled triangles, black filled triangles, illustrates the range of rates at which these ponies would walk on the treadmill. So the x-axis goes from left-hand side slow to right-hand side fast. And the y-axis that is measured here is the amount of oxygen consumed per meter traveled. And what you can see is there's a big U-shape to this curve. That is, depending on the speed at which the pony walks, it can consume more or less oxygen with quite dramatic differences. So there is as we can see from this, there is a speed at which oxygen consumption is minimized. Well, that's interesting. Now we'll turn to the middle data set, which has a much larger curve to it. These are all the rates at which these ponies trotted on the treadmill. Now, that's a much broader range of rates, so these ponies can trot quite slow and they can trot really fast. And as they do so, the amount of oxygen they consume per meter traveled, changes. And once more, you can see that if you trot very slowly or very quickly, you're using more oxygen per meter than is strictly necessary, and that there is an optimal speed at which oxygen consumption in trotting is minimized. The third set shows the data for galloping. Here we can see the beginnings of the same sort of picture, but the data don't go far enough to the right to see the curve going up again. But we can be reasonably confident that these data admit of a similar interpretation. That is, there's a range of rates at which these horses gallop. And if you gallop very slowly, we can say it's you consume more oxygen per meter traveled. We can't say that with great confidence faster just because we have no data there. So for walking, trotting and galloping, in each case, there seems to be a speed at which oxygen consumption is minimized, even though these gates can, can be maintained at a wide range of rates. Now we're going to turn our attention to the bottom half of this graph. These are histograms based on observations of the same three ponies as they were observed after the experiment out in the paddock, choosing themselves to walk, run or gallop. No constraint put on them. And the question is, well, when they choose to walk and when they choose to trot and when they choose to gallop, what speed will they do it at? And we can see that those three collections of black observations there are each located at the minima of the above function. So that when the horses are free to choose their gait, they do so at rates that are optimal in terms of oxygen consumption. Subsequent studies showed that these gates are optimal in other terms as well. So they are also turn out to be optimal in terms of the hoof strain that Okay, is occasioned by the different gates. So it's not the case that evolution has constructed something which uses as little oxygen as possible. Rather, it is the case that there is a broader sense of optimality and that the body moves in conformity with that. So that's an interesting observation about the relationship between freely chosen gates and lawfully imposed constraints. Um, so the physical constraints, the rate at which you walk and so on, are very important. Um, and if we're going to ever address what the brain is doing here, we can't do that without also considering what the body is doing and what the physical constraints are doing. They're all one package. You see, the brain is not special here. The brain is part of a big package, which is the body and the surrounding context. 
So you may think you're very good at walking, but if I put you in the deep end of a swimming pool and say, show me you're walking now, you'll do leg movements, but they won't be walking movements because walking movements require the floor. The floor is a necessary part of what it is to walk. So this organization of the body in locomotion is not just a matter of some part of the body telling other parts what to do. It's a matter of a fit between the physics of the body and the physics of the surround. This is illustrated quite dramatically in a bunch of rather nasty experiments done in the 60s in the Soviet Union, in which um, a bunch of cats were surgically prepared by having all connection from their neocortex to their body severed. So this removes any possibility of voluntary motion. These cats cannot walk. They're paralyzed and they have no muscle tone. They're just it's a terrible thing to do. Under these conditions, if you support the cat with a sling under its belly, which is not shown in the picture, and you put them on a treadmill, and you turn the treadmill on, and you provide a little non-specific stimulation to the base of the brain, what you find is the whole body organizes into a coordinated gait, with the legs coordinated as in any other quadruped gait, with fixed phase relationships among the legs, and furthermore, as you turn up the speed of the treadmill, that organization shifts abruptly from one gate to the other. So starting at the top, you can see the cat on the treadmill. And then in the middle panel, you can see recordings from two limbs. And you can see that there's a fixed phase relationship among them, um, despite the fact that the treadmill is getting faster. And at the bottom, you can see the relative phase of one leg with respect to the other on the same side, and you can see it goes from a relative phase of 0 0.5, that's the anti-phase pattern, to a relative phase of 1, that's the in-phase pattern. And all this, while the cortex has been excluded from the equation, and we usually think of the cortex as the site from which voluntary movement originates. So we can see here that the organization of the body into a coordinated gait is by no means just a matter of telling parts of the body what to do. Rather, the body is quite capable of organizing. It self-organizes. Now, this is a horrible thing to do to a cat. The stimulation that's required, that's delivered to the base of the brain, um, is required to induce muscle tone, but it doesn't tell the cat how to organize itself in any, in any particular way. So that what we see here is that the gate the coordination of the limbs, needs to be understood as an emergent phenomenon. It emerges from the interaction of the entire body with the physical context. And that term emergence is going to turn out to be quite important. Scott Kelso did some rather uh, mean work as well, but did not quite as mean as cutting the brains of cats. He would strap his PhD students and postdocs into a chair like this and turn them into quadrupeds. You know, humans don't make good quadrupeds. Our arms are much shorter than our legs. We're a bit like T-Rexes in that regard. T-Rexes also don't make good quadrupeds. But when you put someone into a chair like this, you can turn them into a quadruped, strap their limbs onto four arms, and you can even then adjust the masses of their limbs by adding weights to those arms. And when you put someone into this device, they've had no experience of being a quadruped in this fashion. And with no experience whatsoever, Ever, they immediately display coordinated quadrupedic gates. So there are four phase relations among the limbs that are shown there in the drawing. There's the jump, the pace, the bound, and the trot. Those are four ways of coordinating the limbs. And people just fall into these without ever being told how to do it or without ever um, intellectually addressing the problem. Furthermore, as you speed this device up, the bound will shift to the jump and the trot will shift to the pace. So this rate-dependent reorganization of the control is turning out to be a very generic signature of movement. And the key finding here is that these completely naive humans, when they're forced to act as quadrupeds, display coordination just like any other quadruped, including rate-dependent switches between the specific gates. So there's clearly something of great generality underlying this. Um, 
Another horrible experiment that you should never do, but that has been done, is to pull off pairs of legs from a caterpillar. Now, caterpillars start with lots and lots of legs. And as you pull them off in pairs, you never find an uncoordinated caterpillar. Despite, after each such horrible perturbation, despite the fact that the caterpillar has never had this number of legs, the result is never a disorganization. Rather, the remaining limbs immediately switch to a new, smooth, fluent, coordinated pattern. Now, while we, I don't encourage you to do that, I do encourage you to learn from it, just as the naive humans became quadrupeds and displayed these modes of organization. A caterpillar of very little brain shows the same kind of naturalness in its movement without ever becoming disorganized as it's faced with the novel situation of an entirely new number of legs. What this illustrates is that the coordination of the body in locomotion is not some kind of intellectual problem and it's not a skill that has to be learnt. It's something that emerges from the physics of the body combined with the physics of the world. 